this is going to be a pretty quick and easy video. We're going to take Batman Return of the Joker and turn it into Mr. Gimmick. Okay? So, the deal is, is this is extremely easy to do if you sacrifice this game, which I'm not going to do in this video. I'm going to show you how to do it, and then I'm going to return it to this. In fact, I still have a bunch of these shells with better labels than this one, so I'm going to put my put this PCB back into my nicest shell and I already showed how to do labels so I'm not going to show how to stick that label on simple um, and I will show two versions of how to do this and one will keep you from destroying a donor cartridge uh, Inf Infinite NES Lives has a PCB for doing this and you can see I put sockets in mine because I was going to use this to test the EEPROMs before I soldered them into the donor PCB. Uh, this was like a year ago and somehow or other it quit working. But it might just be that I was flexing it so much inserting and pulling EEPROMs. I don't know because there is a ton of traces all over this board. Really, really tiny traces everywhere. So it could be I opened up a trace by doing that. I don't know. But this is the board that I was talking about in the other video. It's fairly expensive. Well, last time I looked it was. I don't know what it costs now. Uh, he might actually have people buying him in bulk for cheaper. I'm not sure. But I believe this is the only one capable of doing Mr. Gimmick. Now, about the game itself. There are three versions. There's a Japanese game, I think it's just called Gimmick, and then there's a Mr. Gimmick European version. And I believe the European, European version has extra sounds, and the Japanese does not, or one or the other, or they both do, I don't remember. But the third one is a U.S. prototype ROM, okay? And as far as I know, it's not really out there too much yet, but they released it on Nintendo Age. And that's how I got a hold of it, and how I found out that it goes goes right into the Batman Return of the Joker, as a, you know, for a donor. Um, it does have the extra sounds, and it does not need the extra sound chip or whatever. So it's perfect for making this donor. So let's get into it. Okay, so the 808 is heating up, and Get your uh, 3.8 security bit out. And here's the PCB. Get your SRAM up here, and there's your FME 7 mapper. And we're just going to take off these. Mask ROMs. <laughs> Let me uh, fast forward through this for you. Okay, so all the solder sucked out. Might be time to rebuild my 808. It doesn't seem to be doing as good a job on suction as it used to. Or it could be that this board is not designed very well as far as the holes and vias. That was a good snap. I see one not moving right there. The thing you want to be careful about is pulling too hard and pulling the insides out of one of those holes and then possibly taking a trace with it too. 
That would really suck. Hey, that worked. Bent the board a little bit. Got some of them popping. Oh, yeah. Looks like I got a couple down here that are not cooperating. I've already broken them off, actually. broke a couple legs but there's enough there to solder to if I wanted to reuse these but like I said I've kept all of these as well so I still have I think close to 30 sets of these that's how many I did back in the day well I should say back in the day as in last year <laughs> so I need to clean off the contacts while I've got it out and open but the PCB is ready to use that's the great thing about this donor is we do not need to rewire it at all. So it's in the same class as uh, NROM and CNROM games where you just slap the EPROMs right in there, solder them down, and it should work. Okay, here's a close-up of the board, and upon further inspection, I have actually pulled a trace right here. Telltale was this little piece of copper of the trace sticking up like a piece of hair. I was cleaning the contacts and I noticed it. So I'll have to repair that. Basically what I'll do is I'll just follow this trace up. See it goes to this via right here. So I'll just add a wire from that via back down to that hole. Let's mark them on the bottom side so I can add a piece of wire. This is definitely uh, a big concern for using donors, especially, you know, like Return of the Joker, because this is easily a $20, $25 game. So, you, I mean, you don't really want to just say, eh, I fucked it up, I'll just go to the next one, you know, with in-ROM games, like, you know, I probably had 30 plus golfs and, you know, what's the other crappy in-ROM game I used a lot of, uh, just a ton of in-ROM games that nobody wants, not even for two bucks. But this is different, so I'll need to repair that before I put it back to original, or even to make Mr. Gimmick work. That's too bad. You can make out my two marks I made for the pin and the via, so I can connect those later, make it easy. Okay, so first you're going to want the ROM, which I forgot. You don't get a ROM, you get a patch. And you do have to be a member and logged in to Nintendo Age to be able to see this and download the patch and I might show in a different video how to do the patches it's pretty easy basically you download the patch program and you download the patch and then you are overriding the European Mr. Gimmick to make it into the US Mr. Gimmick and this is the thread Mr. Gimmick NTS-U patch release thread and it talks all about how it's it's different from the Japanese or European. Uh, I forgot this, that the European ROM does not work in an NTSC console because it's 5.6, the original speed, and uses expansion. Uh, Japanese version uses expansion sound, maybe. So it's possible that the sounds are in the Japanese ROM. You just have to have an expansion mod. I don't know. I never got that far. So... I don't think there's anything, any much other information in there, but I've already got it patched and split. Here's the patch file, and here's the European, the parentheses E, .NES ROM. I don't remember if I had problems splitting this one. There was one that I had to do online. I can't remember what that was there was a let me see if I can find it real quick 
I'm not finding it real quick, but it was an online ROM splitter instead of using that program that I showed. The NES Mapper program, which I've shown that I've had problems with, but anyway, this one was on a website. You just uploaded the file and it somehow it downloaded the split files, which was perfect. So anyway, we'll get to burning, and you'll see the char is 128 kilobytes, so we need a 1 meg megabit chip. If you take your calc and just take 128 times 8, you end up with 1024, and that's a 1 meg. Same with the prog, which is 256, so it's a 2048, so a 2 meg, so we need a 1 meg and a 2 meg to burn those two files onto the EEPROM so we can solder them onto the board. Okay, so for the char, I'm going to use a 27C010. And I need 2356, 1011, 12 volts to burn. That might take a second, so I'll skip ahead. And verifying, good. So that's the char. And then load the prog file here. Change it to 27C020. Two, three, five, six, ten, eleven. So it's the same between one meg and two meg for the dip switches. And that will take a little bit longer. Okay, that one verified okay. It took significantly longer. And I'll put the program on back away now. Okay, this is the part where I normally test the EEPROMs on that infant NES live board. Unfortunately, this is all I get. It's just garbled graphics. It doesn't seem to matter how much I play with it. It's never quite right. And I can touch all kinds of things and this does not. Excuse me. It doesn't seem to make a difference. So, I mean, that tells me that the EEPROMs are probably programmed okay, it's just something wrong with this board, so I'm going to go ahead and solder them into the Return of the Joker donor cart, and then we'll retest. Okay, so the EEPROMs are in, and you can see it's a tight fit. I mean, I basically had to almost bend the pins to get the prog in after I had the char in. But what I want to show you was the repair. This is a magnet wire. And I like it because it is solid core, but it has this red coating on it, which insulates it. So it can be touching, you know, open pads or pins or whatever, and it won't make contact. And you have to heat it up to about 750 degrees to melt off that red. And what I do is I put, you know, a little bit of flux on it and heat it up, and then I'll be tinning the end, and then each end on here, and then I can just solder it down and not worry about... Um, you know any of these pins piercing the insulation or it touching and uh, it's a little easier to work with than braided and you know when you're trying to um, strip plastic or PVC off of really pieces of short like ribbon cable or whatever it just doesn't work out as well but this is really easy okay so the game's in and on and this is what it should look like This game could have really been like a really amazing swan song platformer for the NES because it is highly, highly rated and is possibly one of the best platformers and it never got released here.
Yeah, I'm gonna skip all that. See if I can remember how to use the power up camp. There it is. Anyway, I always like to play a little bit just to test it out and make sure it's cycling through everything all right, but it seems to be good to go, so I'm not going to show up, but I'm going to remove these EEPROMs and put the MASCROMs back in, and I actually was able to find an almost mint shell. might be hard to make it on camera, but you might be able to tell just how much better condition this label is in. It's not, um, these just look like they, somebody said they used a really shitty glue on them, maybe. That's why they're, they're always, they always look like they've been submerged in something, like WD-40 or something. I'll be able to tell best in the yellow. Yeah, you can kind of tell it's much darker right here than it should be. See that? That's exactly the problem with that label. And ate a lot of these. And somebody said like 50%. And I agree because I have, like I said, I have about 30 of these. Just a shell with the original label that I did not blast off. And I would say over half of mine look like this or worse. You know, so. Uh, one more thing I want to show you. Okay, so I looked up gimmick in video games. And I've got them sorted by highest price. This is an original gimmick right here. And they're asking 600 bucks. Probably from, I'm going to guess, uh, Finland or, no, oh, this one's in the States. Probably imported from Finland. Seems like there was a, a lot of these uh, in Northern Europe, but not much anywhere else. However, what surprises me is the price of the Japanese game. I didn't think they were this high, and it's possible they've just gone up quite a bit recently. I don't know. I didn't think they were that rare. Uh, and then we've got two people selling reproductions. Um, $100 and $100 start or $140 by now. And then you get straight into the guy that has the boxes and manuals and stuff. And then there's another guy selling just a uh, plastic container. That's pretty cool. Let's see. I don't see just a label though, but I'm sure if you emailed Uncle Tusker he could get you one. I think his name is Vince. Good guy. So I was also interested in seeing what had completed lately. It's like they're having trouble selling that $600 one. So some Japanese ones have sold for close to $300. That's crazy. Here we got a repro that has the box and manual and sleeve. Probably has a star from Spacer in it for $140. There you go, there's one that sold for $104. It got bid up that high. That's that's how much in demand this game really is. Uh, this is probably an original Retro Zone reproduction. They had the clear cases. This is exactly the case I've been talking about that I want to find somebody else to supply to us. And that's the label he made up and used. 
but you can see there's plenty of them sell for quite a significant amount less. And he's calling the full sound edition, which I don't know why he doesn't call it the US prototype edition, but whatever. Okay, there's the label. So he's getting 15 bucks for label, 15 bucks for box. That's pretty decent. Because you can just add, you know, $30 worth of manual and box and be able to sell it for close to $150. Make a little extra money on it. Okay, this is the guy that supplies the board that you can do Mr. Gimmick with. Okay, so I don't believe you need work RAM for gimmick, so I think you can just get away with the $15 board. I don't believe it's battery backed or anything. I uh, don't believe you need sound upgrade, but it looks like you can have it. with uh, flash ROMs instead of EEPROMs for an extra four bucks yeah so that's pretty sweet if you want to do it this other way and not use EEPROMs which I'd love to get into that if I was making reproductions often so it's fifteen bucks for the board and probably a few bucks for shipping is probably where I was getting that eighteen twenty dollars so he also has the retro programmer, dumper programmer. I've yet to get a hold of one of these. I'd still like to. Basically, you put the cart together with flash ROMs and then stick it onto this, and it'll program it for you. So you don't have to dig around with all the EEPROM stuff, and that's quite a time saver. You know, the, the name of the game here is making money. So yeah, there you have uh, Mr. Gimmick reproduction making super easy if you do it the right way. Um, it's very much uh, something you want to think about if you're going to do this to make money. Um, like I said before in the other videos, if you try to sell it on eBay, it might get pulled, it might not. It's tough to say. Mr. Gimmick might be one that won't get pulled since you probably can find the details to link to the game and once they have that they may not, they may not, they may not uh, mess with you, even if, and you've seen what I put them even said reproduction right in that title, which sweet. So, also, you want to think about using flash chips in the dumper to save time and not using a donor board so that you don't spend five minutes or more trying to desolder the mask ROMs and then possibly having to repair the cartridge after you pull his trace, like I showed you, you know, and not to mention the cost. I spent, you know, you could spend 20, 25 bucks on Batman Return of the Joker cartridge, you know, with shipping getting it to you, where you could buy um, a, a brand new board from Infant NES Lives for 15, 20 bucks and spend a lot less time putting it together. Um, we're still back to who's providing new shells, and as far as I know, still nobody has said anything about any, anybody that knows anybody. So, yeah. That's the big, uh, the big uh, issue right here, the big hurdle. So, anyway, that's enough for this video. Um, I probably will get into some more complicated stuff. It, it might be a few weeks though, because October is coming up, and I told a ton of people to not send me their stuff for mod work until October. So I have like a hundred people in line for mod work, and that's crazy. And, I'm, and it's not October yet, but I'm going to start telling some of those people to go ahead and start sending stuff in. Uh, I've got m mostly caught up with RGB mods, and, you know, it's summer's over, so I'm not so worried about doing yard work and garage work and all that stuff. Um, still got a few more videos coming up for the M82. Uh, definitely going to get back on the Sharp NES TVs really soon. Um, there's no updates on the NES RGB component stuff other than I finally did get a hold of Helder and he's sending me a couple of his boards like the first one he sent me didn't work so I'm going to retry that one and of course Kev Triss is on the scene so hopefully I'll hook back up with him soon and I'm trying to push him to hook up some kind of HDMI output mod uh, Bunny Boy has one 
and he even put it in a top loader and I was like super that's exactly the kind of modification that I want to buy from you and then he says I'm not going to do it I'm going to make a whole console so I'm kind of out on that one but if I can get Kevtris to hook it up that would be excellent I really like the NES RGB but not everybody can figure out how to do RGB it's crazy it's it's like a super hurdle for people they're like what's RGB or how do I use RGB and ugh, you know HDMI is pretty universal everybody already has it has the capability of using it so that's exactly where the the, re the, uh, the direction I'm pushing for most of my modification work is not RGB but for HDMI just for that reason anybody can use it so anyway that's the future for videos for now um, I should be getting uh, some more M82 videos up sooner than anything else though so stay tuned